Alright guys, how's it going? CES is just underway, but the talking points are already many and varied. And it's been NVIDIA who's been making the early headlines, with their RTX 2060 launching next week. Alongside that, and perhaps the bigger news here is that NVIDIA will also be supporting Adaptive Sync on certain select monitors. But let's start by introducing the GeForce RTX 2060 Turing for every gamer. On January the 15th, the $349 GeForce RTX 2060 will deliver advanced ray tracing and AI features plus levels of performance previously available only in high-end gaming GPUs at a price point within reach of PC gamers worldwide. $349, a price point within reach of PC gamers. That is very curious wording. What is the definition of within reach? Within or in reach? Inside the distance to which someone can stretch out their hand. And at the bottom, within the capacity of someone to attain something. Okay, so I guess that this conjures up a feeling of something that is attainable. If you just stretch yourself a little, push yourself a little bit further than you maybe went before. And I guess that's fair enough if you're getting something that is a bit beyond what you got the last time. I've said this many times previously, but people buy based on their capacity to afford. Nvidia understands this fully, as we can see on their 2060 page, where they appeal to one third of the GTX installed base, which are owners of the GTX 960, the GTX 970 and the GTX 1060. Of course, the GTX 970 launched at $330, the GTX 960 though was $200, and the GTX 1060, that was $250. $300 for the Founders Edition, but let's forget about that for now, as there no longer appears to be the pretense of Founders Edition higher cost. But just concentrating on those X60 class cards for now. That means the GTX 960 at $200, the GTX 1060 at $250, and now the RTX 2060 at $350. As NVIDIA founder and CEO Jensen Huang says, this is a great moment for gamers and our industry, truly. But now though, we're at the point where these X60 buyers paying last generation X70 prices, all the while the performance improvements continue to drop. The 970 was $330, the 1070 was what, $380? That was a non-Founders edition. But now the RTX 2060 comes right in between that at $350. And NVIDIA shows their RTX 2060 up against the GTX 1070 Ti here. Aside from the fact that NVIDIA proved during their initial Turing launch that their slides cannot be trusted any longer, when they claimed nearly 50% faster and it ended up closer to 30%, the fact that they are comparing it to the 1070 Ti and not the GTX 1080 is in itself quite telling. You remember back when Pascal launched, right? NVIDIA were keen to point out that the 1060 had GTX 980 class performance starting at $249. The GTX 980 cost $550 when it launched in September 2014. And the GTX 1060 here cost $250 when it launched in July 2016. So 22 months later, you got the same performance at 55% lower price. Now the GTX 1080 cost $600, 700 for the Founders Edition, and that one launched in May 2016. But now this RTX 2060, costing $350 and launching now, that is 32 months later, and you get less performance at only 42% lower price. And let's not forget that in both cases, the 980 and the 1080, they were already priced very highly compared to previous mid-range cards. That's why they've compared it to the 1070 Ti instead of the 1080. Because you've waited longer than ever before. You get less extra performance than at any point in recent history. You pay more than you ever did before for a card in this class. And all the while, over those 32 months you waited, Nvidia made record profits on selling graphics cards to gamers. Surely you can all see what's happening. Why did they choose to compare the RTX 2060 to the 1070 Ti? and yet they chose to compare the GTX 1060 to the GTX 980. 
they do this every single time. Surely by now though, the tech press finally has to wake up to this and say, Nvidia, enough is enough. Over at TechSpot, the RTX 2060, more powerful than a 1070 Ti and only $349. Now to be fair though, this article did point out how Nvidia misled us before over Turing. However, these parroting headlines simply help Nvidia get their message across. And over at Engadget, NVIDIA's 349 RTX 2060 GPU is more powerful than a 1070 Ti. I mean, this blew my mind because I didn't realise that stuff gets faster over time. Here I am still using my single core 3 GHz Pentium 4 because I thought tech stopped progressing back in 2005. Over at Tom's Hardware, their review conclusion, NVIDIA's biggest sin is probably calling this card a GeForce RTX 2060. The GeForce GTX 960 started at $200, the GTX 760 was $250, now the company is pushing its X60 series up to $350. The performance we measured certainly justifies such a price but it probably could have been called a 2060 Ti or the 2070 and made fewer waves. No, the problem is actually the price and rather than it costing $350 and being branded the 2060, it should have cost $250 maximum and been branded the 2060. Every new series, you guys fall into the exact same trap of comparing the cards to current generation cards that are all utterly underwhelming. Overpriced crap like Vega and the rest of the RTX series does not justify this card's pricing. I mean, was the 1070 Ti some kind of great graphics card or something? I don't recall a single review lauding that card. In fact, most slammed it as being pointless. Yet all I see everywhere today is how the 2060 is faster than that card. They are just parroting NVIDIA's marketing to a T. Now also, over at Tom's, the 2060 actually beat Vega 64, which seemed pretty unlikely to me. And it was when I looked at the Forza 7 benchmarks that the reason for that was clear. During the RTX 2080 launch, looking at Forza, 1440p DX12 Ultra and 4 times MSAA, we can see the Vega cards are doing very well in fact, 114 and 103.3 frames per second. Vega 64 even beats the Titan V. And if we now go to the RTX 2070 review, same game, same settings, same scores, 114 and 103.3 frames per second. So the numbers are exactly the same and there's nothing unusual about that. Many benchmarks get rehashed at least one time. However, once we get to the RTX 2060 review and it looks like the benchmarks have been redone, the settings remain the same however, yet now the Vega cards are way, way down in where they were before. 74 and 71 frames per second. Vega 64 was ahead of the 2070 in the 2070 review, but now it is well below. According to this, the settings remained the same, so we're either looking at a testing error which affects all the AMD cards, or more likely AMD has broken something in their most recent driver. Regardless of which of those is true, the 2060 is clearly not faster than Vega 64. Otherwise, it would also be faster than the 1080 and Nvidia would have made you write that for your headlines instead. I can't help but feel that over time, some in the tech press just feel the need to throw Nvidia a bone ever so often. 4 out of 5 for the RTX 2080 is just about fair. 3.5 out of 5 for the RTX 2070, that also seems fair to me. I do not feel that 4.5 out of 5 though is even close to reality for a card that goes backwards in time to market, backwards in price and backwards in performance compared to the previous generation. Now I'm not meaning to have a go at Tom's here and in fact I rate Tom's fairly highly in general. However, I am simply compelled to do what I can to protect what very little PC gamers have left. This X60 class of GPU is the last thing that PC gamers have left. Over the past decade, we've watched the high end and mid range prices go from high to stupidly high and now Nvidia is clearly attempting to do the same with the entry level, which is what the X60 class of GPU now is. If I just let this one go unchallenged, what's the stop $450 for an RTX 4060 18 months from now? 
With 4.5 stars out of 5 for this one, you've just given Nvidia the green flag to go ahead and do it. Over at Anintex Review, and as usual, we get something much closer to the real story. Not quite mainstream. Against its direct predecessor, which was the GTX 1060 6GB, the RTX 2060 is faster by around 59%. In context, the GTX 1060 6GB was 80 to 85% faster than the GTX 960, which was a 2GB card at launch. And it's now more like twice as fast because of the increased frame buffer. But at $200, the GTX 960 was a true mainstream card, as was the GTX 1060 6GB at its $250 MSRP. And this is an interesting point too, because the 1060 did have 4GB of extra VRAM to pay for, yet prices only increased by $50 over the 960. But there is no mincing words about the continuing price creep of the past two G4 series. The price to performance characteristics of the RTX 2070, 2080 and 2080 Ti, and of course the Vega cards, is what renders the RTX 2060 a better value in comparison, and not necessarily because it is great value in absolute terms. Why is it that some reviewers understand this point, while so many others don't? Why do some reviewers continue to compare against what we have today, compared to what we had previously? If you're always going to settle for less every single time, you're going to get less and less every single time. NVIDIA are a great marketing company. Their fancy coolers and fancy adverts are all paid for with ever-increasing prices at ever-decreasing performance levels, while too many in the tech press continue to turn a blind eye to their greed. Just buy it. Some better news for all you prospective RTX 2060 owners is that hopefully soon you won't need to shell out an extra $200 for a G-Sync monitor as well, as one of my older predictions appears to finally be coming to pass. It was all the way back in September 2016 during my FreeSync video when I said that Nvidia would be forced to adopt FreeSync in the long run, and that free is the proper cost for this technology. Well, NVIDIA has just announced that they'll be supporting Adaptive Sync under the G-Sync compatible branding. They didn't mention FreeSync, of course, that's AMD's branding. But I've got no doubt that they won't be happy about many in the tech press using the FreeSync brand while reporting this. And that got me thinking further about what NVIDIA are really up to here. As you know, one of the main reasons why G-Sync is so much more expensive is due to the requirement for the proprietary module which, according to outlets like PC Perspective, allowed for more consistent performance with G-Sync compared to FreeSync. The story here was, this was all down to the G-Sync module allowing for different overdrive rates depending on frame rate, and stuff like low frame rate compensation. And in fact, NVIDIA's Director of Technical Marketing, Tom Peterson, suggested this on multiple occasions when claiming reasons for why G-Sync was better than FreeSync. Over at Forbes a few years ago now, where Tom was interviewed and said stuff like, When we invented G-Sync, we determined very early on that in order to accomplish everything we wanted, we needed to be on both sides of the problem. At the front end, where we're controlling the GPU, and the back end inside of the monitor. For us, having the module inside the panel allows us to deliver what we think is a very good experience across a full range of operating frequencies for refresh rate or frame rate. We have some really significant technology inside that module dealing with the low end of refresh rates. And then towards the bottom of the article, we have anti-ghosting technology so that regardless of frame rate, we have very little ghosting. You see, variable refresh rates change the way you have to deal with it. Again, we need that module. With AMD, the driver is doing most of the work. And part of the reason why they have such bad ghosting is because their driver has to be specifically tuned for each kind of panel. They won't be able to keep up with the panel variations. We tune our G-Sync module for each monitor based on its specs and voltage, which is exactly why you won't see ghosting from us. So it was this whole line of variable overdrive and all this low frame rate compensation stuff that was a justification for why the proprietary expensive G-Sync module was so desirable. Of course, back then during this Forbes interview, FreeSync was the newer technology. And it's true that AMD didn't have the ability to do low frame rate compensation in their driver. However, that did come later. So all that was left for G-Sync is this bad ghosting point. 
which as many discovered later, didn't seem quite accurate as various G-Sync panels do in fact exhibit ghosting while some FreeSync panels don't. And it wasn't long before we started seeing FreeSync monitors with variable overdrive functionality, effectively doing the exact same thing that the G-Sync module supposedly does. But let's go over to Anantech again for a look at what they're saying over the whole NVIDIA FreeSync move. There were some interesting points here I thought, and again many that reflected my own initial thoughts on the matter, and of course some that don't. This one was interesting. Though they don't discuss it, NVIDIA has internally supported Visa Adaptive Sync for a couple of years now. Rather than putting G-Sync modules in laptops, they've used what's essentially a form of Adaptive Sync to enable G-Sync on laptops. As a result, we've known for some time now that NVIDIA could support Visa Adaptive Sync if they wanted to. However, until now, they haven't done this. Coming next week, this is changing. On January the 15th, NVIDIA will be releasing a new driver that enables Visa Adaptive Sync support on the GeForce GTX 10 and GeForce RTX 20 series, Pascal and newer cards. It won't be enabled automatically for most monitors, but the option will be there to enable variable refresh, or at least try to enable it for all Visa Adaptive Sync monitors. So basically speaking, if a monitor supports Adaptive Sync or FreeSync, then NVIDIA's cards can finally take advantage of that variable refresh. Full stop. And this is fair enough. Great, in fact. I've been calling on NVIDIA to do this for years. Next up though, Anantech, and something that drives me just a little bit batty. NVIDIA has held since the first Adaptive Sync monitors were released that G-Sync delivers a better experience. And admittedly, they have often been right. The G-Sync program has always had a validation quality control aspect to it that the open Visa Adaptive Sync standard inherently lacks, which over the years has led to a wide range in monitor quality among Adaptive Sync displays. Great monitors would look fantastic and behave correctly to deliver the best experience, while poorer monitors would have quirks like narrow variable refresh ranges or pixel overdrive issues, greatly limiting the actual usefulness of the variable refresh rate features. The problem I have with this is that what it actually comes down to in reality. Expensive FreeSync monitors perform the same as expensive G-Sync monitors. For the latter, you're basically talking G-Sync monitors as the vast, vast majority of them are expensive because of the module. There's over 50 G-Sync monitors available now and the cheapest one on the market today, 380 bucks or so? And this is 1080p. I mean, there might be one or two a bit cheaper than that, but in general, G-Sync monitors cost an awful lot more than FreeSync monitors. So what we're really talking about here is, in general, not always, but the cheaper FreeSync monitors that have dubious adaptive sync ranges, like for example, between 48 and 75 hertz, or worse, I mean, I've even seen FreeSync ranges of between 48 and 60 hertz. However, the choice here is, take your pick between that or nothing at all. I would rather have a poor FreeSync range on a $100 monitor than no G-Sync range on a $100 monitor, and so would you. But moving on and looking to exert some influence and quality control over the Visa Adaptive Sync ecosystem, NVIDIA's solution to this problem is that they are establishing a G-Sync compatible certification program for these monitors. In short, NVIDIA will be testing every Adaptive Sync monitor they can get their hands on, and monitors that pass NVIDIA's tests will be G-Sync compatible certified. And right at the very bottom, it is noteworthy that of the monitors approved so far, none of them are listed as supporting variable overdrive. So all that crap we got from Peterson over years about how the G-Sync module was blah blah blah, and here they are now supporting Adaptive Sync under their G-Sync compatible brand, and no variable overdrive functionality in sight. I don't know for certain, but I'm reasonably sure that NVIDIA will have chosen a bunch of the best FreeSync panels currently around regarding ghosting, or just general panel quality, and are now certifying those, whatever that entails, as being good enough. The real danger here is, what exactly does this entail? You've seen the iron grip that NVIDIA has over the add-in board guys and the OEMs. We saw that with the GPP, the GeForce Partner Program. NVIDIA easily has enough sway to get paid for this G-Sync certification thing. What do you gain out of it though? If you're an AMD graphics card owner, what do you gain out of this? Higher prices? The monitor guys are going to be trying harder to get that G-Sync certification. 
and video will want to get paid. This will end up for higher prices for you for something you already got for free. Now, to be fair, I 100% agree that AMD hasn't done enough regarding quality control on these. Too often that is their policy. We'll provide you the means and you go do whatever you want with it. The end result is, some panels end up with some pretty crap FreeSync ranges. Again, in my opinion, still way better than nothing. What's less forgivable though is, say, stuff like the FreeSync flickering that exists on some panels. Some very expensive panels. That should have been dealt with properly, and I have no doubt that NVIDIA would never allow this. But make no mistake about it, whenever NVIDIA gets involved in anything like this, it is about two things. They want to be paid, and they want their brand splashed all over the good stuff. How long before FreeSync is no longer the brand on these higher end monitors? Replaced by G-Sync compatible. And I'm going to end this part of the video with a surprise to many of you by saying, AMD, this is what you deserve. You haven't done enough quality control here, and you constantly leave yourself at the mercy of Nvidia's games. I can't remember exactly what video it was, but it was a couple of years ago when I said that when NVIDIA is finally forced to adopt FreeSync, they will do it in a way that pushes their brand over AMD's. That's exactly what they're doing here, and as usual, AMD will just play the victim and they will do nothing to prevent it. Right, now finally, and to end this rather angry video with some better news from the AMD side. Obviously, there is Lisa Su's CES keynote on Wednesday and we're all hoping for some big news. As you might expect, I am constantly looking for new information that supports my information, and once again, the data miner, Apisac, over at Twitter, appears to have delivered with yet another codename Discovery. If you recall from the last video, we saw the first evidence of Zen 2 on the desktop, with what appeared to be an 8-core, 3.7GHz part at 65 watts and 32 megabyte of L3 cache. The new codename is 1D1212BGMCWH2. Compare that to the previous one, 5D0108BBM8SH2 underscore 37. The best way to do this is just to split it up. The first number, as per the codename decoder, is the prototype generation. So lower numbers here should be earlier prototypes, presumably with more disabled features and lower clock speeds. That's generally how it has been in the past. Later prototypes are closer to final silicon and generally have higher clock speeds. If that still rings true for Zen 2, in this case, we're looking at the very earliest silicon, prototype generation 1, engineering sample 0. D for desktop, that's easy enough. These next four numbers are the main cause of confusion, and over at Reddit and on Twitter, we thought we'd cracked AMD's code, but I don't think so. What these four numbers are here remains a mystery, and we need more samples in order to figure it out. Here's where it gets interesting though, at least from the perspective of my leak. You remember in the previous sample that BB equals 65 watts, and in this new sample, BG equals 105 watts. If you remember, my leaked 3700X is stated as a 105 watt CPU. Next up, M stands for AM4. So this is how we know that it's Ryzen and not Threadripper. C stands for number of cores. You programmers in the audience instantly know that C equals 12 in hexadecimal. So 0 to 9 would be 0 to 9. 10 would equal A, B equals 11, and 12 equals C. We already have a 12 core Threadripper part anyway, so we knew instantly. But this is a Ryzen part with 12 cores and 105 watts TDP. Possibly even more interesting though is the next letter, the cache configuration of W, for which nothing so far exists in the codename decoder. The Threadripper 12 core chips have 32 megabytes of L3, and they were designated with 9. So if this new Ryzen chip had 32 megabytes of L3, it would also have been designated with a cache configuration of 9. The fact that it doesn't almost certainly means that W here stands not for 32 megabytes of L3, but a humongous 64 megabytes of L3 cache. Clearly, we are talking about two chiplets. I really doubt that AMD has created one monolithic chip with 12 cores and 64 megabytes of L3. That would be the same size as the current Ryzen's on 14 nanometers. This early on on the 7 nanometer process doesn't seem likely. 
The stepping of H2 is the same as the previous leak. And only today, Apisac updated his Twitter post to say that the chip has a 4 GHz boost clock. Whether or not that follows the same format as the previous chip, where we saw this underscore 37, where we're not actually sure if it does mean the boost or the base clock, that one remains to be seen. Now, at this point, I should say that the main leak is not the only source I have on 12 and 16 cores. In fact, right after the main leak video launched, I had another smaller leak from somebody who is pretty likely to be in the motherboard industry. I didn't ask, but the information made that rather obvious to me. They also told me that 12 core and 16 core chips were coming for AM4. However, they disagreed strongly over the timing, claiming that the 12 core chips would only launch at Computex. And this latest leaker also told me about Intel's newest F and KF chips, which were confirmed only today. Basically, put all this together, anybody who is holding out hope of Ryzen 3000 only being an 8 core part, just abandon all hope of that. The chances of all of this being wrong is effectively zilch. Apisac's codename is simply the final proof for me that at least 12 core Ryzen 3000 exists. And if 12 cores exist, you can be certain 16 cores also exist. The only thing left up for grabs now is the timing and the clock speeds. As I said, this latest leak also appears to be genuine and certainly has good information. And they are claiming a much later, around Computex, time frame for the 12 and 16 core parts. The reason for this apparently being that AMD are trying to stagger the launches, trying to get the most mileage that they can get over the year. The assumption being, launch the 8 core parts first of all, then launch the 12 core parts, then launch the 16 core parts. For me though, Threadripper is going to be launching in the third quarter anyway, and that does the same thing. That keeps the momentum going, so I fully expect all the Ryzen 3000 parts before the end of May. They have to hit that anniversary on the 1st of May. We also saw a previous leak from Gigabyte, however, suggesting that their X570 would be launching at Computex, which is late May, early June. So there are definitely pointers there towards a much later launch. But with that said, last week I got an email from one of the motherboard guys asking me if I'd be interested in reviewing their upcoming X570 motherboard. That question is being asked way, way too early for X570 to be coming so late. So what is going on here? Well, I expect we'll get a little bit closer to the truth, at least after Lisa has given her keynote. Which of course I will be analysing in full in a video presumably coming very soon. While we don't know exactly what Lisa's gonna say, one thing is absolutely for sure. 2019 is gonna be the most interesting year in tech in years, if not ever. We'll catch you later guys.